what's up, baby? It feels so good to be back into the live streams. You know what I'm saying? I just, it, it's just natural to me. It's just, it's just what my bread and butter is, my ethos. It's my milieu. It's where I come from. It's where I was raised. And somebody said, Henry Kissinger is getting wrecked right now going through the toll houses. <clears throat> Shout out to my boy, Henry K. Peace out. <laughs> Flights to the moon. <laughs> Passing through the toll houses. But hey, he's got a sexy motorboat voice. So maybe that Barry White styles that he's got going on with his intonations can get him a little bit of an edge when it comes to the gatekeepers. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? St. Peter's standing at the gate saying, Henry, what you got for me? And Henry says, blah, 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 blah. With that motorboat voice, maybe it's good enough. We'll find out. Today we're going to talk about <coughs> one of the key men of the 20th century in terms of global elites. We talk sometimes about different types of classes, the brains and the bloods. You've got the blue bloods, the elites that base a lot of their so-called right to rule on bloodline purely on their bloodline, magical bloodline, lineage, whatever. <clears throat> and then we have the brains. Right? These are the people who are recruited into the establishment quite often to be chess game operators, right? Zbigniew Brzezinski, the grand chessboard. Zbig is another figure much like Henry Kissinger. And in fact, uh, Kissinger is who recruited Zbig to be Zbig. <laughs> <clears throat> and we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but we're going to work through several books uh, and what they talk about in regards to old Henry. Um, and in many ways, Henry represents, I think, kind of the apex, the archetype of the Cold War uh, and the old guard of the new world order. So uh, Kissinger is, of course, again, a key political mainstay He's been there throughout, I don't even know how far back, administrations. We'll look at a little bit of his bio here in a second. But <clears throat> really became a key <clears throat> operator in the Cold War. A key operator throughout uh, <clears throat> Nixon administration, Carter administration. And then <clears throat> being kind of put on a retainer, I guess, as a consultant, uh, a.k.a. A consultant, a.k.a. deep state operator. Uh, all the way up until probably his death, I'm sure. And for people like <clears throat> Kissinger Brzezinski, that was really their role. They played these roles very effectively. And I think uh, pretty much everybody would agree that Henry Kissinger was, like Brzezinski, a capable architect of today's globalist order. So whether you think he's good or bad, I'm sure most of us here would agree that he was a, uh, a monstrous kind of individual. But... Nevertheless, he was, uh, you know, old guard, uh, capable operative and was able to <clears throat> be utilized. Uh, in other words, I, I would classify him like this. <clears throat> David Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger, for example, spotted Zbigniew Brzezinski when he wrote Between Two Ages, which uh, I did bring with me. <clears throat> and uh, they saw, <coughs> they said, hey, here's a guy with a lot of potential to really be a general in our uh, order, in our system, in our control structure. And so they set up for Zbigniew Brzezinski in 1972 or three, an entire uh, steering committee for him to run known as the Trilateral Commission. And that was uh, another one of these high level committees like Beberg, uh, like the CFR, um, and other entities, uh, you know, the Bohemian Grove, that function at that higher level of being, as we call them, steering committees. And so they're kind of like above government. They're above intelligence agency type operations because they are, uh, in the words of Helmut Schmidt in his book, Men and Powers, kind of gatherings of the most powerful men in the world, including the titans of industry. And so, although Henry himself was not a titan of industry, 
he was rather recruited into this power structure uh, to be one of the functionary planners, uh, chessboard players like Zbig. So Henry is kind of the, uh, you could say, the um, mentor to Zbig. And interestingly, Hen Henry outlived Zbig. But both of them um, were really kind of placed where they are via David Rockefeller. And David Rockefeller talks about this. It's pretty prevalent throughout the literature that this is how this uh, situation ran. And we're going to look at some things that are pretty interesting in regard to Henry because a lot of people don't know kind of his uh, background in terms of what he was really up to. So the weird thing is that you'll find all kinds of kind of sanitized public information, right? There's all kinds of sanitized uh, public stuff. And there's all kinds of, you know, glowing memoirs. And even his Kissinger's own recent book, which I bought uh, not too long ago, ironically, since he, you know, maybe a month ago, doesn't actually deal with a whole lot of high level material really the only relevant part of the book is the last chapter which we'll talk about here in a minute and i mean it's tell it's telling what he titled his book right world order <laughs> so steering the world order what kind of a world order are we going to have that's what we're going to talk about today but <clears throat> if you get deep into the you know the espionage literature um which is where we typically go, you find stuff that other people don't know about because all the information that comes out, you know, on normie mainstream dinosaur media outlets, they don't know anything about and they're not able to touch on, you know, the black ops and this kind of stuff. <clears throat> so we'll get into some of that, um, some of it I already covered, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the topics that uh, maybe I didn't cover when we did Gladio. Because if you remember the Paul Williams text, Gladio was, according to Paul Williams, pretty much run by Kissinger. But we're going to take a look at uh, Daniel Ganser's PhD thesis on Gladio because there's some sections on Kissinger in there as well. We're going to look at David Rockefeller's memoirs, what he says about Henry. And I don't know if you guys caught it, but uh, the... This week on uh, Lord Voldemort, Alex had Roger Stone <clears throat> uh, uh, on to talk about the passing of Henry Kissinger and the role that Kissinger had, according to um, Roger Stone, in terms of organ uh, uh, in a way, kind of helping to plan Watergate, which Roger Stone says was really done by Alexander Haig. Uh, Roger Stone said that the real deep throat was Alexander Haig, uh, famous uh, Pentagon operative military guy who was a big time globalist of yesteryear. <clears throat> um, Roger Stone also argued that Kissinger and Haig were responsible for sabotaging pretty much the uh, Nixon administration and uh, really, that, that, that Nixon was forced into um, preparing the way for the positive relationship with China and that that was kind of a David Rockefeller uh, Kissinger operation. And I think that's pretty clear. Actually, I think that's talked about. Yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole chapter in David Rockefeller's memoirs on how you know he went over to China and prepared all that way before uh, Nixon did. So guys, if you would hit like and share, I want to shout out to a couple of the fat super chats. Honeybee has already sent a hundred dollar super chat. Wow. Thank you so much, honeybee. That's a big old fat super chat. We appreciate that. Pat Buchanan, DC $5. I'm Pat Buchanan. Well, I hope that's the real Pat Buchanan, but I doubt the real Pat Buchanan is over here super chatting at me, but we'll pretend that it is just like we get super chats from Kanye, Katy Perry, and uh, who's the other superstar? I don't remember. Oh, Dave Chappelle, <laughs> supposedly. Right, guys, hit like and share. Let's look at a little bit of what 
is Henry's public background. <coughs> yes, I'm still a little sick. Henry Kissinger, Henry Alfred Kissinger, born in 1923, an American diplomat, political scientist, geopolitical consultant, politician, served as Secretary of State and NSA advi- National Security Advisor to Nixon and Ford from 69 to 77. Kissinger fled Germany in 1938 as a, a Jewish refugee, served in the U.S. Army in World War II, and then educated at Harvard, became professor of government, earned an international reputation on nuclear weapons and foreign policy, and often acted as a consultant to government's think tanks and the presidential campaign of Nelson Rockefeller. And this is where you can begin to see, even in the public record, a very clear uh, sort of Rockefeller recruitment in regard to the character of Henry Kissinger. He immediately begins to work um, in Nelson's uh, operations. And I'm pretty sure Nelson was uh, head of CIA in Latin South America. Let's make sure that that's right. I think that's right. <laughs> During the Cold War. Um, let's. <clears throat> I apologize for all the <coughs> snorting, but I am still sick. <clears throat> yes, I'm correct. Let's see. Um, FDR placed Nelson in charge of uh, CIA operations in uh, Latin America. So yes, and this is why you see, for example, uh, Nelson Rockefeller pictured with Papa Doc Duvalier popping off of some of that voodoo. Popping off of some of that Rockefeller voodoo, baby. And, um, let's see. Kissinger was a pioneer of detente with the Soviet Union. Orchestrated the open relations with China at the behest of David Rockefeller. <clears throat> Engaged in shuttle diplomacy. Uh, worked to end the Yom Kippur War. Negotiated Paris Peace Accords. And uh, helped to supposedly end the Vietnam War. Of course, I believe that the Vietnam War was intended to be a kind of a never-ending sloth of despair uh, psyop on America as a whole. Kissinger had been associated with many controversial policies such as the campaign to uh, bomb Cambodia. And I think this is what leads to a lot of uh, countries still calling him a war criminal, right? So some pl- some places supposedly said, you know, oh, if he, f- if he flies here, he's going to be arrested because he's a war criminal. Um, <clears throat> for his involvement in the Vietnam War, he got the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, shocker, if you don't know, if you haven't figured it out, but Nobel Peace Prizes are themselves psyops, right? They're, they're engines of propaganda, organs of propaganda that go to people uh, for the purpose of propping up the ultimate NPC normie narratives. I mean, uh, Barack Obama got a Nobel Peace Prize, right? While he was literally engaging in multiple proxy wars and drone wars. I mean, this is kind of crazy that basically it's, it's the war of, in, it's, it's the award for inversion. Right? So if you're the greatest inverter of things, you get this award, right? So whatever you're actually up to, uh, you get the award for the opposite. So basically, the, the great warmongers uh, get the peace award, which is perfect for uh, an Orwellian world. So basically, an Orwellian award. That's a good way to put it. Uh, guys, guys, smash up the like. That's my Kotel impression. I'm just kidding. Love you, Kotel. Just a joke. Uh, if you would hit like and share, we got a nice uh, almost 500 on a balmy. Sunday afternoon. I don't know why it's not balmy. I just like to say on a balmy Sunday afternoon. Sounds very literary. Let's see. Uh, Support of the Argentinian military junta. So I guess this would be School of the Americas type stuff. Indonesia. uh, Bank Pakistan. Bangladesh liberation. Uh, there's a genocide there apparently that he was involved in. And then after leaving government, he, uh, started this consulting firm, Kissinger Associates, <clears throat> and then offered, uh, some dozen books on, uh, diplomacy and international relations. 
Kissinger's legacy is a polarizing subject in American politics, widely considered to be an effective Secretary of State and a pragmatic real politic practitioner. He has also been accused of war crimes and the civilian death toll policies that he pursued in support of dictatorial regimes. Uh, so that's what we get in regard to Kissinger. One thing I did want to check was if there was, uh, if, he, if he had a intelligence, yes. So he was involved in military intelligence. And for the, a lot of this old guard uh, of the elite power structure, especially like David Rockefeller, um, they made their bones, so to speak, in military intelligence. And that's also the case with David Rockefeller. Um, there's, a, there's a section in his book where he talks about working in intelligence and that his time working in intelligence is what allowed him to really uh, make all of the networks and the connections that he made. Uh, so, for example, in David Rockefeller's biography, page 418, he says, all of these global elite organizations that he helped to create, and this chapter is about uh, Bieberg and um, CFR and Trilateral, he says, <clears throat> all of these organizations reflect my belief in the principle of constructive engagement. As an intelligence officer in World War II, I learned that my effectiveness depended upon my ability to create and develop networks with reliable information and influence. And this is how, basically, after leaving, he goes on and sets up his uh, family's own private intelligence network. And so basically, we get the same thing with Dr. K. You know, stuck in a K-hole. Get stuck in it. Will, will you be stuck in the K-hole with me? If you do a little bit of ecstasy, a little bit of molly, you will be stuck in the K-hole. I'm just joking. I know that ketamine, I know it's not molly or what. I just, I don't know. It just sounded funny. Again, so don't get stuck in the K-hole with Henry. Um, a lot of people try to put their face in the breasts of strippers to motorboat. Over here, we motorboat by doing impressions of Henry Kissinger because he has the most motorboat trolling motor voice of men ever at all times. And what do we see with Henry? The exact same. Oh, also just like Dave Rockefeller, he was in military intelligence. Kissinger was then reassigned to the counterintelligence corps, uh, tracking down Gestapo. And then after that <clears throat> goes on to study at Harvard. Now, here's what, what's interesting that a lot of people don't know this. I've known this for a long time. I learned this back when I was reading Spangler, maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And I read that uh, Kissinger had actually written one of his undergrad, I think, theses on Spangler. And people, I remember mentioning that and nobody, they said, no, uh, uh, uh. Yes, his undergraduate thesis was The Meaning of History. The Meaning of History Reflections on Spangler, Toynbee, and Kant. It was a 400-page uh, text and was the origin of the current limit of word lengths. So Henry uh, himself is the limit for undergraduate thesis, apparently. <laughs> 35,000 words. Um, so it sounds like an interesting paper. And by the way, at that time, he was actually seeking to do what? To work as a spy for the FBI. So we're definitely dealing with a person who understood from an early age a lot of the intelligence side of how the world works. And just like David Rockefeller said, that's kind of a key element to understanding the real world. And that's why we focus, not totally, but a lot of the, on that over here. Now, moving out of this normie domain, if you remember in this talk that we did covering Gladio and the Ganser and the Paul Williams books, and also the Kaler uh, normie CIA narrative book, you'll notice that we covered... Uh-huh, yeah, sure. 
we covered uh, William's books in uh, Williams's book in depth, and Williams has a unique insight in that some of the other writers on Gladio have kind of only really scratched the surface when it comes to Kissinger's role in Gladio. But according to Williams, it was actually I've got the the Ganser book on there, and I need the I need, I need the Williams book, not the Ganser book. It was actually Henry that was running Gladio. Maybe I don't show the book in the part one. The video on this one, I'm going to repeat it. Anyway, I don't have my Williams book with me. It's at the other place. So, uh, But anyway, the, the Paul Williams uh, Operation Gladio book, great book. If you uh, go to this talk here, you can get a fuller, more in-depth, deep dive specifically on the nuts and bolts of Gladio. But again, according to Williams, um, it was Kissinger that was running basically the Italian government through being the point man that spoke on the on behalf of the CIA and the Pentagon, the deep state, to Licio Gelli, who was the head of P2. That is the uh, Masonic mafia that was behind the Gladio operation. So let's take a look at what Ganser says about Kissinger because he does have a couple pages on Kissinger. I'll make this brief. I'm not going to sit here and read a bunch of stuff. It'll be kind of boring. So we'll hit some of the highlights of what <clears throat> Ganser says about Kissinger. We'll also look at what uh, Ephraim Ingdahl has uh, on Kissinger and we'll look at David Rockefeller and Kissinger himself here in a moment. I thought I saved this page. Let's see here. <clears throat> here we go so if you have a Ganser's thesis uh, here NATO's secret armies uh, interestingly backing up sort of what Roger Stone said he mentions Alexander Haig uh, so he says Years later, it would be revealed how much of the P2 director, Licio Gelli, that's the uh, head of the P2 Lodge, had manipulated Italian politics in order to keep the communists out of power. Gelli was born in 1919, but it was only part partially educated, expelled from school at age 13, enrolled in the black shirts at age 17, fought for Sp Franco in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, during World War II, he was a sergeant major of the fascist uh, division of SS Hermann Goering. He only narrowly escaped the Italian left-wing partisans at the end of the war by fleeing to the U.S. Army. Frank Gigliotti uh, of the U.S. Masonic Lodge personally recruited Gelli and instructed him to set up an anti-communist parallel government in Italy in close cooperation with the CIA station in Rome. It was Theodore, uh, Ted Theodore Shackley who was the director of all the covert operations in CIA, for CIA in Italy in the 1970s in an internal report of the Italian anti-terrorism unit confirmed he who presented the chief of the Masonic Lodge to Alexander Haig. According to the document, Nixon's military advisor, General Haig, and that's again who Roger Stone said was uh, deep throat and was really responsible with Kissinger for sabotaging the Nixon administration and Watergate. Haig commanded the U.S. troops in Vietnam thereafter from 19... 1974 to 79. He served as NATO's SACUR, S-A-C-E-U-R, and Nixon's National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, authorized Licio Gelli in the fall of 1969 to recruit 400 high-ranking Italian NATO officers to join this lodge. So here you have Ganser in his PhD thesis backing up the idea of Paul Williams that this was a USCA run uh, Masonic operation known as the P2 Lodge. There, that's page uh, 74. Gelli's contacts with the United States government remained excellent throughout the Cold War. As a sign of trust and respect, Licio Gelli was invited in 1974 to the presidential inauguration of Gerald Ford and in 1977 again for Carter. When Ronald Reagan became president in 1981, Gelli was proud to sit in the first row. Uh, he was Washington's man in Italy, and as he saw it, he saved the country from the left and, quote, deserved a medal. In 1981 of April, 
Milan magistrates, in the context of a criminal investigation, broke into the villa of Licio Gelli and discovered the files of all the P2 and the existence of which had been formerly unknown. So this was the shadow government that the U.S. was basically controlling and running Italy. By the way, it still does. So for those that don't know, the EU countries are still run via these kinds of shadow networks, be it Germany, be it Italy, or whoever. And this is precisely why those countries are being transformed out of what they used to be, if you catch my drift. That's all. That transformation is by design. Because if you remember uh, all the way to uh, Count You-Know-Who, uh, in his books, he had said 100 years ago that the plan would be to really alter the European nation states and turn them into something else. Islam is very useful for that. And that's going to be all the more ironic when we get to the uh, one of the last interviews that Henry Kissinger did before he passed away, which was actually on the same topic. And we'll see what Kissinger himself said. Now, again, remember, to the public purview, to normies, right? Oh, Henry Kissinger is just a diplom diplomat. He's just a government boring bureaucrat who goes and has boring meetings with other politicians. And they just... They just try to govern the world the best that they can. No, no, no. These are deep state operatives running super duper high level black ops all over the world. And none of that's in the mainline normie literature, except that sometimes you can find it uh, kind of mentioned in passing, like in David Rockefeller's memoirs, for example. So moving on to, uh, let's see, Kissinger and... Um, Kissinger and Licio Gelli. Uh, so they raided Licio Gelli's villa, got all these P2 documents. Parliamentary investigation under uh, Tina Anzelmi. To the massive surprise of most Italians, revealed that the secretive anti communist P2 member list counted about 962 members with a total membership of 2,500. And it read like a who's who of Italy. Now, I'm not going to rehearse all of this. We've already done multiple Gladio streams. You can go read that stuff elsewhere. Or excuse me, you can read the books or you can watch the other live streams that we did on this. And again, this is not a conspiracy book. Right? You guys understand this is an academic text from uh, what university? So Ganser is a himself a think tank researcher for the Center for Security Studies in Switzerland. So again, this is this is not a conspiracy text. It's a thesis. I'm trying to remember what where he did his, where he did this thesis at. Uh, this is a book that that is printed in academia for security studies. So basically, if you were to do high-level uh, international security research, you would read this book. If you were getting your PhD in security studies, you would be reading this book. Okay, so this is not a conspiracy book, all you normies and skeptics out there. It's a real-world black ops book. <clears throat> so then it goes on to talk about where P2 lodges were throughout Europe. Um, the, the book actually details all the different European locations for the CIA using these uh, P2 lodges. And there was one more thing about Kissinger I was trying to find. Uh, by the way, if you would, hit like and share. Also, remember that our show sponsor is Chalk.com. I will remind you about the wonderful, amazing properties that Chalk products have here in a second. Uh, Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger. 79 that's the other page so let's see what else was said anything relevant about kissinger here so basically that one page kind of in passing backs up williams's thesis on kissinger um oh <clears throat> So the word was uh, heard in Italy where many were 
surprised that Aldo Moro, together with the Italian president, flew to Washington to discuss the inclusion of the Italian left in the government. Their hopes were shattered. Gerald Ford pardoned Nixon for all of his crimes in the White House and the key players in the Nixon administration and kept them in office. In a heavy confrontation with Kissinger, who under uh, Nixon had served as the national security advisor, and he was now under Ford uh, serving in the power position, power, powerful position of foreign minister, the Italian representatives were told that under no circumstances would the Italian left be included in the Italian government. It, firmly rem- it would remain firmly within NATO. Uh, now, again, remember that this doesn't mean that, oh, so the right wing in America are the true conservatives and they're the good guys. No, this is not, this is like false dialectic left wing, right wing. Okay, so we're not, it's basically, do you want neoconservatism or do you want communism so again false dialectic that's all that's all we're talking about here um but apparently kissinger and others uh presumably then played a role in the staged kidnapping uh of aldo moro although i think aldo moro did end up getting well he was kidnapped and he was killed eventually and um the argument is that that was actually the cia did that and blamed the Red Brigades, and it wasn't actually the Red Brigades that did that. By the way, I'm not saying that that means the Red Brigades are good. Everybody in this channel knows that we hate communists. Uh, but we also, Jamie, can you not do that? So, uh, by the way, there's also a, a section here on the recruitment of Lucky Luciano, uh, which we've talked about. We've actually talked to... The uh, most famous living gangster about this. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you guys know that, but we did the uh, the full live stream, or actually the full live stream that we did with or, uh, interview that we did. It wasn't live; it was recorded, I think, with uh, Sammy the Bull, the most famous living gangster and hitman. The most famous living hitman. Look at that. When you when you type in Sammy the Bull, you get me. What? Uh oh. So if you missed this uh, excellent interview, be sure and go watch this. Because actually, in this interview, we talk about that. We talk about um, organized crime and the relationship of organized crime to the deep state, if you missed it. So be sure and go watch that over on Sammy's channel. <clears throat> we also did about, I don't know, five or six other podcasts with Sammy, too. So, but this touches on. Um, you know, real world stuff that we covered in the book or that we covered in my talks. And it's also covered in the Ganser book here in this chapter, right? The, uh, the real war and the secret war in Italy and the recruitment of uh, Lucky Luciano always been a close relationship between the intelligence agencies and organized crime. We also covered this recently in the deep dive that I did on the history of Britain's control of the opium lanes and the opium wars so if, again if you miss those these are like some of the most telling shows that we did podcasts that we did and uh you know i don't know if it's the algorithm probably but sometimes these don't get many views like this one right here secrets of the no, secrets these, of the just... trade right there see that one i mean if you want to understand how the real world really works which is a big part of what we do over here be sure and go watch that because um, that really gives you an insight into the world. And again, remember, you know, this is the kind of stuff that Kissinger would be studying, right? Henry Kissinger is not reading a bunch of boring normie textbooks. Okay. He was doing Gladio stuff. <laughs> okay. He was interacting with cults, setting up black ops, arranging, you know, assassinations. I mean, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Now, let's move on past Gladio and his operations there. Thank you. Appreciate that. And let's talk about some of the other operations that people have attributed to Henry. Um, I know that somewhere it's Ingdahl's, it's in Ingdahl's books. I can't find it because 
I don't remember which Ingdahl book it is. So I've got like five or six Ingdahl books. But Ingdahl is the one that discusses, I think it's in Full Spectrum Dominance, but I, I looked under Henry Kissinger and I couldn't find this reference. It might be also in his uh, excellent book, uh, Lost Hegemon. But there's a section where Ingdahl discusses the fact that all that 1970s oil crisis stuff, that was all run by Kissinger. It was Kissinger that came up with this plan to arrange the oil crisis to then um, basically make America rely on the uh, Arab oil supply. And I think critics of this policy point out that it was a globalization effort because it would mean that America wouldn't tap its her own oil reserves. It would, it would be integral to this globalization effort. And I mean, I don't know all the details of all the motivations of why Kissinger did that, but it also might play into the long-term global plan of making us just simply dependent on uh, foreign oil and resources. Because if we're, I mean, and that goes along with globalization, right? I mean, if we're independent as a sovereign nation, we're going to be using our own resources. We're not going to spend all of our time you know, catering to and begging, uh, you know, all of these sheiks and, and Saudis and Saudi princes for oil uh, or supposedly cheap oil. If America basically sits on, you know, gigantic oil reserves. And my suspicion is that this also contributes to the myth of peak oil and peak oil is part of the austerity scam. And that actually makes sense with the other policies that Henry Kissinger will push. And this is the key thing. This is the most important part of today's discussion beyond, uh, you know, K Kissinger being at Bilderberg or something like that, or Kissinger being involved in Gladio way bigger than that. Way more important than that is Kissinger is the person, the point man for putting America on to the eugenics plan. Now, it's David Rockefeller and his family, primarily, that have the money and the power to shift America in that direction. But the point man who does this at the government policy level is Henry Kissinger. And he does this under the Nixon and Carter administrations. So if you're wondering, how do we get to where we are, where our government pushes the craziest ideologies and is so completely corrupt in regards to um, human biology and, and SEX ethics and, uh, you know, reproductive health, right? Certainly there were people prior to Henry. We, we know that the Rockefellers pushed this through the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, which they set up a long time ago. We know that, yes, there were uh, eugenics laws, sterilization laws way back a long time ago in what, like the 20s and 30s, but <clears throat> for the entire power structure and particularly the government to convert over to this and make this official policy, it's Henry Kissinger. It's State Department Memorandum 200 and it's the Global 2000 Report. And those are Nixon, Kissinger era um, transitions. And that was all done by Henry Kissinger. I mean, not just him, but other people as well. So National Security Memorandum 200 in 1974 was this confidential memo by Kissinger as the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, to discuss how we have to adopt this global um, anti-population depop status because of the fact that there's limited resources. And if we let the third world grow then the third world will eat all the food and we're all going to be broke and poor because all of the, the third world is eating up all the food and they're going to they're going to take over. Now that's ridiculous because at the same time, right, we're told, oh, we have to um, open up our borders to everybody in the world. By And by the way, Kissinger is also an architect of that policy. <clears throat> And so don't buy into his lament in his last interview when he lamented this because he's one of the architects of all this. So it's just total just nonsense. 
Uh, I mean, maybe it's possible that he had some regrets before he was going to meet his maker. I don't know, but I wouldn't buy into any idea that, oh, well, you see, he was a good guy all along. No, he wasn't. This guy was a total uh, operative, one of the key operatives to completely transform uh, America over to where we are, right? And we got a nice uh, 600 plus tonight. Glad you all are here. If you would hit like and share, thank you guys so much. We'll get to these super chats in just a second. Now, again, so the, the auspices of the um, 1974 State Department memorandum are, look, we got to implement uh, eugenics depopulation narratives because the population growth, if it reaches a certain level by the year 2000, will be catastrophic to the world, Right? And that's what produced this under the Carter administration called Global 2000, the report to the president. And some people say, oh, well, but this didn't actually get implemented. Yes, it did. It was just implemented covertly. Even if all the aspects of this were not immediately implemented under Carter, it doesn't matter because you're dealing with people who are very adept at statecraft. I mean, Kissinger's undergraduate thesis was 400 pages about Toynbee and uh, Kant and Spangler. And remember, Toynbee is a Tavistock uh, global elite Fabian socialist. Okay, so Kissinger, as an undergrad, was studying Fabian socialist elites, right? But now Global 2000 is this gigantic... I mean, you, you, you can't, it's, this is like super too, way too super boring to ever actually read this. Right. Um, but what you need, all you need to know about this is just basically that it's a breakdown of all the sections of the globe and how particularly like Latin South America and Africa, how, if they're allowed to industrialize and if they're allowed to have modern technology and whatnot, then their populations will uh, overrun and they will destroy the first world and they will eat all of our food. <laughs> um, and it even includes, you know, a lot of these kind of UN scare things like the, the UN desertification conference of 1977, that if we let population grow, there'll be climate change in the world. It's all this fear and terror stuff, right? Like, oh, everything's going to turn to deserts. And, you know, it's going to be in, in times of apocalypse if people have babies. So we got to do everything that we can in covert ways to halt uh, any growth. And especially you can't allow those people to uh, modernize or industrialize because then they would have the means to have even greater growth, which is ironic because typically... Uh, countries that industrialize and become first world uh, see a decrease in the population. But maybe they were not aware of that yet at this time. Um, and now I take that back because Miles Copeland says that they knew that. Uh, but regardless, <clears throat> it also could be <clears throat> that they saw the third world at this time maybe as a test bed. Right? So they knew that eventually they were going to use the techniques and, and uh, strategies <clears throat> of depop <clears throat> on the first world. And particularly the West. So perhaps at this time they were still engaged in um, psyops and experimentation uh, on, as to what were the effective methods by first testing it on the third world and then bringing it home domestically. And Kissinger, again, was absolutely key in this. In fact, the Kissinger memo mentions the the year 2000. Presumably he's, re gonna re he's referring to what would be this... <clears throat> this um, fear narrative presented to uh, Carter. So Kissinger's memo is 19... Yeah, it's got to be, because Kissinger's memo is 1974. And then the Global 2000 Report is 1980, is the first issuance. <clears throat> and by the way, that's not the only one. Uh, there's actually a bunch of these. So there's all these different... Uh, things that occurred under it's called the Kissinger report by the way that occurred under Nixon where Kissinger was pushing all this 
uh, State Department memorandum was reworked and adapted uh, to to be <laughs> in SDM 314 under Gerald Ford in 1975. This was actually classified for over a decade until researchers in the 1990s discovered it. The memorandum was subsequently uh, used that the U.S. should use means of population control uh, to control the <clears throat> underdeveloped nations. And again, it's not like any of this is a surprise. I mean, it's literally in every global elite text that was already public. I mean, you could you could read this in anything from David Rockefeller prior to this. So it's not like this is some shocking, whoa, shocking what that they believe in. But the difference here is that this is becoming government policy, you see, in the 1970s. And <clears throat> they were already pushing for it for a long time, but now it's actually successfully becoming government policy. policy. And a lot of, you know, uh, uh, cynical individuals out there might say, well, yeah, but I mean, come on, don't you, don't we have to at least admit that there's too many people and we, you know, look, uh, you know, we got to do this because of, you know, there's not enough room on the face of the earth for people to fit. That's all nonsense. It's all made up narratives. I mean, just think about all of the stories that they've told to back this up since the 1970s, like the clips about the ice age, right? Oh, if we don't limit population, we're going to have a new global ice age by the year 2000, right? We've all seen the Leonard Nimoy clip, right? <clears throat> you guys have seen that? It's the same story over and over and over, right? Uh, we'll have a new ice age. And then they changed it. Oh, no, it's not an ice age. Uh, we're all going to get cooked because of the hole in the ozone layer. I remember the 1980s, dude, they were talking about this eight, eight, stupid nine. ass hole in the ozone layer all the time. And we are going to be microwave. We're going to be sizzling bacon by, by the year 2000. Okay. That's what they were saying in the eighties. Uh, I'm not sizzle bacon. Okay. I mean, I'm sizzling hot. We all know that, but I'm not sizzling bacon underneath you know, a microwave sky because of a hole in the ozone layer. What a bunch of not like who actually believes that? Well, they actually just just gave up on that. Nobody even talks about the hole in the ozone layer. Uh, now it's just straight up climate change, right? It used to be global warming. Now it's climate change. As in the past million years, it has advanced and retreated with clockwork regularity. If we are unprepared for the next advance, the result could be hunger and death. On oh, did you hear that? It's clockwork regularity that we're going to have a, a, a new ice a scale. This is the 1970s propaganda. In all of history. What scientists are telling us now is that the threat of an ice age is not as remote as they once thought. During the lifetime of our grandchildren, Arctic cold and perpetual snow could turn most of the inhabitable portions of our planet into a polar desert. In 19... A polar desert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you just get rid of, like you, like Slow Boy said, get rid of hairspray and cow toots, we're all good. Oh, by the way, that's why you need to kill all your cows. I'm not joking. Did you see that they're saying, uh, was it one of the North, Dutch Dutch farmers got to kill all your cows? Kill cows for climate change. And by the way, how ahead of time was our boy, uh, Lil AIDS, AKA Tristana, right? I mean, Tristana, Tristana was so ahead of everybody on this, man. Shout out to my favorite, uh, second rate rapper on the internet. Uh, after the first rate rapper myself, <clears throat> Tristan Haggard, because I remember like the second podcast I ever watched from Tristan was Tristan saying they're going to ban meat. They're going to try to get rid. They're going to force all this fake meat, vegan burger, kibble, fake food, synthetic crap meat. And that's all coming. It's all by design. And even when Tristan was saying that in 2017, 18, I was like, I mean, I know they're eventually going to do that, but really you think they're going to start trying to ban me how are they going to get away with that no no, no. Oh, they're just going to like kill the cows and say that 
So here's the article. Yahoo Finance. Cows produce gases which threaten their existence. Wait a minute. Cows produce gases which could threaten their existence. So we got to kill them. Welcome to Orwellian gaslighting contradictions. Right? I mean, that's, that's literally what Tristan was saying years ago. Remember when Tristan was like, look how dumb the vegans are. The vegan logic is if we want to reduce animal suffering, we should just get rid of the animals and then there won't be suffering. And now you're literally seeing mainstream articles written with open 60 IQ contradictions. I mean, let's read this again. Cows, like all living mammals, produce greenhouse gases, which could threaten their existence. So Ireland is considering killing 200,000 cows to meet the European Union's climate targets. Wait a minute. I thought the European Union was this socialist thing that is different from America. No, who set up the EU? Not tiny mustache man dummies. Who set up the EU? The OSS and the CIA did. The same people that Kissinger was controlling so you'll notice this policy this anti-human anti-natalist austerity anti-nutrient diet anti-milk anti-meat get you eating kibble and bugs you'll eat the bugs it's the same plan the same policy and all they ever do to push it is use scare tactics. The scamdemic, right? Oh, you're all going to die. Oh, we're all going to be in an ice age. Oh, we're all going to get cooked by the whole ozone layer. Oh, climate change is going to send natural disasters. We're all going to die. All the coastlines are going to be flooded, right? Remember Al Gore's stupid movie, Inconvenient Truth? When I was in undergrad... I wrote a scathing critique and, re and uh, made fun of that movie on a paper because our professor told us to watch it. And she gave me uh, an F because I uh, uh, just made fun of it. Talked about how stupid it was. Talked about how uh, polar bears aren't, like they're not on a small chunk of ice that's melting and they're going to drown. Because polar bears can actually swim. Remember that propaganda picture? The ice caps are melting. And because the ice caps are melting, we're all going to drown. Remember this? This was that this is this propaganda footage that they had back at the time. They would show this polar bear. Oh, look at this propaganda. Polar bears are interbreeding due to melting sea ice. <laughs> So they don't have enough room to go find some polar bear punani. All they got around is bro and sis and mom and dad. They're having, do you see how cruel you are? All you bigots forcing these bad boy polar bears into being degenerates. It's not their fault. It's your fault. Polar bears are having to engage in I-N-C-E-S-T, the unspeakable. So that you can have your steaks and your sweet berry cream. Sweet cream. What is it? Sweet cream? Jamie? Sweet cream? What is it that I, I'm supposed to be all about? Sweet berries and cream. You're causing the death of the polar bears. So you're actually dealing with an insane cult. But this insane cult is not insane without a cunning, devious rationale behind it. And the reason that we don't ever get anything done is not because, uh, uh, or changed or fixed, is not because of these leftist people. It's the idiot right-wingers, so-called, and the 
conservatives, they're the reason that nothing ever changes because they won't ever, they refuse because of ignorance, stupidity, they're bought off or they're cowards. They always refuse to address the actual issues because addressing the actual issues would require them to admit that Global 2000 is part of the problem and that it's been in place for decades and that Henry Kissinger was one of these major architects. And it would really call into question the entire government apparatus and the power structure for the last, uh, well, at least 100 years, right? So we can't go there, right? So, oh, it's the incompetence of the government leaders. Look at Biden. He just goes like this. Look at him. He's, he's so incompetent. <laughs> Biden's a fool. Buy my neocon book. Biden's an idiot. Woo! Biden's an idiot. Like, who doesn't know Biden's an idiot? Everybody with an IQ over room temperature knows Biden is a puppet. Why don't we never get nothing fixed? Why don't we never get nothing? Because we don't actually look at people like Henry Kissinger. So let's see what... Is this not... Let's see what Henry Kissinger says about his book, his last book, which we have right here. World order. What's old Henry say about world order? Let's see. Coming Henry, Henry Kissinger and Jeff Greenfield for the Free Library of Philadelphia. This is not my plan for tonight. Um, this Notice the entire audience is uh, literally gray hair. Uh, gray hair and bald, shining heads. So what, all boomers. I don't see anybody non-boomer, right? So the only people that respect and admire this monster are these totally out of touch delusional boomers by the way i forgot somebody reminded me in a comment i forget who said it that uh yes john coleman actually mentions in committee of 300 uh kissinger involved in gladio at the very beginning i think and kissinger running watergate i forgot that that's in uh the john coleman book so you can also find that information there which seems to line up with the facts book world order covers roughly 400 years of diplomatic, geopolitical, and military history and in four or five continents. We have a little less than an hour. Um, when we finish dealing with the whole book, we'll talk about tax policy. <laughs> but what I want to do is to take, Dr. Kissinger, what you have written and see its application today. I think anybody looking at the headlines would look at your book and say, what world order? Um, the Westphalian peace that you talk about where states respect each other's in territorial integrity, balance each other out, don't interfere. You look at ISIL, which crosses national boundaries. You look at the United States bombing in Syria to stop ISIL, to, which helps protect the Syrian dictator we want out. Um, you have Afghanistan, which you describe really less as a country than a yeah, Assad is not a dictator, by the way. of tribes whose central mode of power is resentment and vengeance. Can you look at the world today and actually say, yeah, I, something like a world order is either possible or still extant, or is that an old concept that is simply not applicable today? Well, uh, first of all, I agree with you that there is no world order today. And uh, perhaps if I tell you what induced me to write the book, I was having dinner with a friend, professor at Yale, and I was discussing various ideas I had for writing a book, uh, most of which had to do with historical episodes or personalities. 
And he said, you've written a lot of history. Why don't you write something about what concerns you most? By the way, to help you understand, the idea that there is no world order is really just a reflection of the attitude that they're usually projecting that we live in chaos. We live in a time of turbulence and there's just no solutions to the chaos and the turbulence and the problems until we bring world governance. Until we have effective world governance, there's always going to be this, this chaos, this craziness that, that we can't. But at the same time, for the most part, not everything, but for, for the most part, the world's chaos and turbulence is a managed and controlled and desired chaos and turbulence. Not everything. Not everything is completely controlled. But if you look back to, for example, the arc of crisis strategy of Brzezinski, this was a post cold. This was towards the end of the Cold War, helping to actually end the Cold War in the Soviet satellite states. Kiss, uh, uh, Brzezinski's plan was uh, manage crisis, arc of crisis. So promotion of chaos. I mean, Gladio was large scale usage of T E R R O R and fake flag events. So that's what they mean. They mean the the lack of total control is actually the chaos and the lack of world order. That's what he means. And what concerned me most at the moment is the absence of world order. The fact that for the first time That's what I'm saying. The absence of world order, meaning the absence of total control, which they would the like to have. Are interacting with each other. In the classical period, the Roman Empire and the Chinese Empire existed without any significant knowledge and acted without any reference to what the other were doing. So the reality of the present period is that different societies with different histories are now parts of a global system because, but that they don't have an agreed concept of world order. So uh, I began with the Westphalian piece for two reasons because uh, that is the only formal system of world order that has been devised. And because it was the dominant system in Europe and because the Europeans as part of the imperialism brought it around the world as a concept, but there was a unique aspect to the European experience. In most, in every other part of the world, whatever order existed was part of an empire. In China, the idea that states balance each other didn't exist. And in the Islamic world, it didn't exist in, uh, in, 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 in that sense. Now, this is really important because this is actually the last section of the book. This is what he says at the end of his book, which is about the balance of powers. In other words, a dialectical model is what ensures stability. And so I'll read what he says here because this is key, I think, to, to, you know, to ancient world empires. There was no notion of controlling my opposite. And that there would be a, a higher level committee that could control and run both sides of a conflict. But you begin to see then why Kissinger would favor this uh, uh, aiding and propping up and building up of China uh, as a counterbalance to the United States. Because it's a better model if everybody is distracted into this uh, dialectic. It's a better way. It's a balancing way to govern versus one single power that enforces the same powers everywhere. The two, the two apparent opposites 
can run their spheres the same way. China can have its social credit score. America will develop its social credit score. By the way, the last chapter is about tech and how tech is the key to this. And the challenge will be to figure out a way wherein you can have a global order run by tech with this balance of opposites. Cryptic fragments from remote history and antiquity reveal a view of the human condition as irremediably marked by change and strife. World order was something like fire. It was fire-like. Kindling in measure and going out in measure. With war, the father and king of all, creating the change in the world. So worship of flux, Heraclitus, right? The unity of things lies beneath the surface. It depends upon the balanced reaction of the opposites. The goal of our era must be to achieve that equilibrium, the dialectical management of opposites. By the way, Brzezinski says the exact same thing. The goal of our era must be to achieve the equilibrium of the balancing reaction of opposites while restraining the dogs of war. So control the actual war and chaos. Don't let it get too far. But manage the world order with a fake dialectic. That's how I interpret what he's saying. And when we look at, I think, his... Uh, intellectual background studying um toynbee the fabian socialist studying kant uh, the german idealist or transcendental idealist studying uh spangler uh and his you know notion of societies as organic structures with a lifespan a birth a flourishing and a death um, we can understand that that's kissinger's approach his realpolitik is that the best way to manage and govern is with a healthy healthy balancing of opposites right which is a kind of gnostic manichaean idea and i would presume if he was running and managing all of the p2 lodges in italy through licio galli that he would be familiar with the gnostic idea of the balancing of opposites as well in freemasonry although i don't know of kissinger himself personally talking about masonry from the black ops information that we have that would seem very likely so there you have it again uh the basics are just the things that we often talk about right uh and there's another important interview here that we'll look at here in a second we got a few super chats <clears throat> temple hat girl ten dollars kissinger was originally appointed to be the head of the big nine commission except that it was discovered that one of his clients was in the Usama Bin Laden Foundation. Interesting. I wonder why that would be. Uh, Bush had an open door policy with Henry. <clears throat> hey, Jamie. Could you bring me a water? My throat's really dry. <clears throat> um, Klaus Schwab. Shout out to my boy Klaus. Uh, by the way, for those that don't know, the... World Economic Forum and Davos are also a product of Henry Kissinger, the Harvard Research Project, and the CIA. So Klaus and Davos are actually the beautiful offspring of Henry. So if you're wondering where that comes from, that's where it comes from. And you can go to uh, Johnny Vedmore over on Rockfin, who has done a lot of excellent uh, research and deep dives uh, into this with Whitney Webb. I think our friend Courtney actually, Courtney just had, thank you. Courtney just had Johnny Vedmore on to talk about uh, this whole history of Klaus. But a lot of people don't know that, that that's where, um, that's where the World Economic Forum comes from. Yeah, so I'll put this right here. Here's Courtney's talk with Johnny Vedmore. Um, you can go watch this, where they do a deep dive into the history of the World, World Economic Forum and Klaus. So shout out to my boy Klaus, bringing in them fat super chats. He says, The man out for the count, but the game still rolls on. 
We must pour one out for the dead homie. Well, um, I doubt Klaus is going to be pulling, pouring out a real 40. He's going to be pouring out those poop beers that Bill Gates is producing for all of us plebes. AC, $20. Shout out to my boy AC. He says, why did masonry thrive in Italy when the other dictators tried to stamp it out uh, and remove the competition with internal problems? Well, Gladio is why. Because the type of masonry that was propped up and used here was this uh, were these lodges that were not what Mussolini wanted to stamp out. So these are these P2 uh, fascist-minded lodges that began to exist uh, right before World War II um, and up into World War II <clears throat> that, uh, that the CIA found useful uh, to oppose uh, a potential future Soviet invasion, right? So... So this kind of masonry was allowed and promoted because it was amenable to the West and the CIA. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're missed, the, if you missed earlier on in the stream, we did, we talked about my uh, Gladio streams. Also a reminder too, if you go over to Rockfin, be sure and subscribe to our sister podcast, Richard Grove over there at Grand Theft World. Richard's going to be live here in a little bit uh, covering the waterfront in terms of geopolitics. He does a seven hour podcast, Grand Theft World. So head on over to Rockfin and subscribe to Richard right here. By the way, thank you guys for, um, the super chats and yes, uh, uh, correct. Johnny Vedmore is also on Rockfin. I was just pointing out that I just saw that Courtney had him on. So I'm not trying to tell people not to subscribe to Johnny Vedmore. Um, Let's see. So he is on Rockfin right here. And here we are with one of the gifts. Uh, and he's done a lot of this uh, in-depth research into the origins of the WEF. And it, it comes from Kissinger. So that's where we get the WEF and the research Harvard Research Project. <clears throat> um, Johnny writes for Whitney Webb. So I don't think that he stole, I mean, he could have stolen from Whitney Webb. I don't know, but he's a writer for Whitney Webb's uh, thing. So I think they work together. Uh, let's see. Yukon 90210 sends $7. Thank you so much, Yukon. Alan Ray, $5. This is not related to the topic. The main argument against carnivore diet is that it's Anecdotal anecdotes aren't evidence. Trust science, not stories. Is that a valid objection? Uh, no, I think the main argument for the carnivore diet or ketogenic diets is that meat is factually 100% absolutely the most nutrient-dense foods that you can eat and that our intestines are made to absorb the most nutrients from meat and meat fats especially. So, um, no, I don't think that somebody just saying that the carnivore diet is not evidence and that you're supposed to trust science is any kind of a good argument. I mean, why do you think, do you think that Klaus and all of the people pushing fake meats and vegan diets, I mean, do you think they have your best interest? Do you think they really want to save the planet? I mean, come on, don't be naive, dude. Come on. Uh, let's see. The dude said for $10. Um, thanks for doing a lecture on Dune. I look forward to more content. No rush. I'd love to hear your thoughts on GE. I think that means God Emperor. Maybe I did cover these. I can't remember some of the, because I was having to do, uh, pre-records because the live streaming wasn't working at the other place. So I don't remember if I did all these uh, super chats or not. I think we did do these. Uh, let's see here. So now, again, one of the architects, again, of um, open walls, if you know what I mean. Tear down the wall, build a wall. Right, the people who oppose Trump's wall 
And what does he admit? And at the same time, Israel is exposed to a particularly brutal form of war, exactly 50 years after the Yom Kippur War. Is that also a consequence of Western naivete in dealing with Islamist fundamentalism? It's a result, in part, of the Hamas believing that they could start, undertake such an action with the support of its neighbors and with the acquiescence of other countries, including Europe, without serious damage to themselves. If they had not thought that, they would not have undertaken it. Henry Hamas just said that for each attack on Gaza, they would kill warriors can appear openly and take hostages and kill people liberated by Israel in the sense that Israel gave it, there cannot be peace. What do you expect from uh, the European Union? I'm looking for a specific quote about the open borders. It should make clear to countries. Being born in Germany and having uh, survived the Holocaust, how does it feel if now on Berlin streets Arabs are celebrating the attack on Israel publicly and are distributing sweets uh, to other people? I do not have a grievance against the German people. I find celebrations about what happened, which technically was a sort of criminal act, uh, as painful. It was a grave mistake to let in so many people of totally different cultural and religious and concepts because it creates a pressure group inside each country that... Oh. So what do you know? Oh, I guess now he's a far R-I-G-H-T extremist, right? the architect of the global order, admitting that totally open borders uh, and the complete Islamicization of the EU has created a pressure keg. What? Shocker. But of course, the power structure that he is an operative for knows very well and has known for a long time. I mean, he was studying in his undergrad days, the Fabian socialists, who were themselves the architects of the Islamicization of U the UK first, which was a test bed for the rest of Europe, as the Ratu book explains in great detail. So, no, he, he, didn't, he didn't just figure this out. Avi Musaif, $5. Review the Alex O'Connor-Ben Shapiro debate. It has a lot of good material to work through. That might be fun to review. We'll see. What books do you recommend to understand Byzantine politics? Uh, Stephen Runciman's book or John Julius Norwich's book on Byzantium. Patara Coxie, $5. Explain the Paris School. Uh, <clears throat> it's just a uh, attempt at recovering what they thought or what they believed to be the patristic idea versus... Uh, the influence of uh, scholasticism and uh, Roman Catholicism and Latin theology. So resourcing our theology from the church fathers. So I think that uh, Lossky and Florovsky overall are good. Doesn't mean I agree with every single opinion that each of them says. I think that any person makes mistakes here and there. Um, but there's nothing controversial about uh, Vladimir Lossky's theology. He's taught pretty much everywhere in the Orthodox world. And um, so I don't know who would brand that as modernist. I mean, you can always have people who think that any position that they disagree with is is modernists. Um, I don't think they're modernists. Asia Orange, $5. 
I'm glad the Kissinger uh, left us, but the old guard is dying out. Yeah, so we've seen in the last few years, actually, uh, David Rockefeller passed, um, Kissinger passed, Zbigniew Brzezinski passed, uh, Charlie Munger just passed. So uh, somebody made a good point that it's going to be funny when this next generation of people that are tasked with running the NWO, which they... A few years ago at Beeberg, they basically just passed this on to uh, all the tech dorks. And uh, I don't really think that, I mean, I think these people are very evil, but they were competent. So what's going to happen when incompetent people are trying to run the NWO? My guess would be that they think that they're at the point where they can maybe hand this over to AI to, to run itself. I don't know how advanced AI really is. It's a lot of bs on the internet and people speculating as to it's alive dude it's like scan it Ugh. yeah right uh i don't know about all that but um doesn't mean it can't be a danger it may be a danger they might program it to come after everybody who's you know <laughs> not a complete uh mind-controlled zombie but um anyway scientology apologist why are y'all talking about the OCA and the Paris school. We're talking about Kissinger. There's nothing to do with what we're talking about. This is off topic, but should the OCA be avoided if the Rokor and Serbian Antioch churches are nearby? I mean, I would just say go and visit the individual churches and figure out uh, uh, what the right fit is for you. It's not a matter of like, oh, there's a perfect jurisdiction. But so that's what I would say. Guys, look, what I'm trying to say is if you don't want to be a soy jack man, you're going to have to take control of your own health and masculinity. And we got some big interviews coming up in the next week. It's going to be fun. We got a couple masculinity focused interviews that are, that are coming for you. I think they're going to be uh, high charged. I was able to find a rare Kissinger soy jack today so I hope you guys appreciated that rare thing but if you don't want to turn into a Kissinger soy jack if you want to move in the direction of the direction I'm moving in then what you want to do is head on over to chalk.com and get a hold of some of that Chad mode baby see that boy right there that's your boy right there Chad mode Chad mode is the ultimate clean pre-workout and Chad mode is available over at our show sponsor chalk.com and uh, Jamie and I have been enjoying for the last month and a half regular attendance at the gym. I don't mean a guy named Jim. I mean, Jim, do you go to gym? Are you at gym? Do you even gym, bro? Well, if you are going to go to the gym, which I do recommend, every guy should be do, start starting to do this stuff. Too many ridiculous soy boys out there. Then head on over to chalk.com. You don't want to be an old uh, Henry Kissinger soy jack man. You want to be the Chad mode man. And chalk, chalk will help you do that by especially this performance stack. This is a potent pre-workout synergy strategy, including the Tonkat Elite proven in peer review studies to boost testosterone. That's our awesome uh, Tonkat Elite right there. We love that. Uh, you also get some of the Action 2.0, a great energy boost, as well as that really intense Chad mode. Now, I'm going to warn you, um, I took a big old heaping thing of this, and it was too strong for me. Like, I did a big old heaping, like, that much of it, and I was just like, all right. So, I, wouldn't, I would recommend <laughs> going easy on it. It's kind of like, like Licka made for Chad's. All right. I mean, you're supposed to put it in some water, but it's like super tart licamate. I like it. But it's actually made for your pre-workout. So this is no joke. It's great stuff. Uh, it's a brand new product that Chalk just premiered. Be sure and get you some of that Chad mode. You see that stack right there? It's not going to cost you $134 because of Chalk being our show sponsor you get the awesome Dyer discount, 50% off. Use the promo code J50, that's J-A-Y-5-0, to get 50% off that awesome performative enhancement 
tool, Chadmo. And by the way, uh, you can use that promo code for any of the other products as well. There's male vitality, female vitality. Uh, there are products related to hormone health, mood focus, energy boosting, detoxing, inflammation response. There's superfoods, nitric oxide, and collagen support to make you beautiful, to make you into an e-celebrity diva like myself. We know that probably at least 80% of this audience seeking is seeking actively to become an, an internet e-celebrity diva. And Chalk Mode will Chalk Chad Mode will help you do that. As well as all those awesome other all I can't talk tonight. All of those other awesome chalk products. Chalk.com. Use the promo code J50. J A Y five zero. J A Y five zero. No, it is not full of crazy drugs. Basically, if you just watch the Dune streams, okay, chalk is the spice melange. If you want an analogy to fiction, it's the it's the spice melange. By the way, I went super deep on Dune. Where y'all at? The Dune, the Dune analysis hadn't even hit ten thousand yet. Did people not? I thought everybody loved Dune. I don't know what's going on. Where y'all at? Go watch the Dune show. Here it is. But, but there's also where y'all at? Right here. Get on over there. Do your homework. Doing your homework. Internet celebrity equals incel. Shit. Dang. Y'all being rough tonight. Y'all, y'all deflating my ego balloon. Damn, son. We got a bunch of Kissinger fans in the audience, butt hurt because I was making Kissinger jokes. <laughs> all right, uh, but also, by the way, uh, remember I am back to get. I've got all of the stock in. So people were like, "Where's my book order?" Well, some of the books were back ordered, and I was out of town. Good news is everything has arrived. So tomorrow, all of the orders will go out. Don't be freaking out. I haven't forgotten you. Everybody's book order goes out tomorrow. And if you are interested in the books and you don't have them yet, and yes, I'm still working on SR Hollywood 3. It just takes forever with all the stuff we got going. Head on over to jasonalysis.com and go to the shop and you can get access to uh, all of our products in terms of signed copies. You want a signed copy of everything that we got? It's right there. If you want my books, Jamie's books, it's all right there. Did y'all watch Jamie's awesome breakdown on Lord Voldemort? She did great. And uh, that is over at Rockfin. I just put it up a few minutes ago. So right here, check this out. Jamie just uh, unloading on the fourth hour of Lord Voldemort. It's live on Rockfin. Go subscribe to our Rockfin as well or to the website and check that out. She did really good. Um, let's see. Was there one more Kissinger thing? What did I want to, I want to look at one more thing. No, we did World Order. So anyway. So yeah, you have to, if you want to understand where we really are, you got to look at some of these big architects of the global order like Henry Kissinger. And uh, most people don't want to do that. Uh, most people want to remain ignorant. They want to focus all their time and their energy on puppets like Joe Biden. And nothing ever changes. What nothing? We can't fix nothing. Because people spend all their time and energy on the lightning rod of Joe Biden. And they don't look at the real power players like Henry Kissinger. Uh, but thank you to... Our smart adept audience, you guys know what's going on. You guys are figuring it out. So shout out to all you guys. Love you guys very much. Again, hit like and share. Share this. We don't get algorithmic promotion unless you guys promote it. So please share it. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be back with a lot more.